Good day and welcome to Church of the King Online. My name is Sharma Raynal. I'm your online campus pastor and it is so great to be with you online for week two of our road trip series. Now we have a very special in-house guest that we are so excited to be preaching for the very first time. But before I give over to him and introduce him properly, let me just get all the announcements out of the way. First off, thank you so much for all of you that are connecting and becoming a part of our spiritual family. Our hope and our goal here at Church of the King is to connect you with relationships and resources because we are better together. The best way that we know how to do this is through connection. And if you want to get connected today, maybe this is the first time, maybe this is the second, the millionth, or if you just stumbled on this video, we want you to be welcomed and we want you to grow in your relationship with God and with others. So hit the connect button available on screen in the description box and in the app available as well. And then we want to say thank you so much for your generosity. Because of your selfless giving, we get to do online ministry. We get to be a difference maker wherever God calls us. And thank you so much for partnering with us. If you want to sow, you can do so today with the info available on screen in the description box on our app or just by following the instructions available on screen. Now, I'm so excited to be introducing Pastor Kevin Ducharm from our Kinder Campus, joining us online for the very first time. We are so excited to have you. Over to you, Pastor Kevin. Well, hey, I am Pastor Kevin. I pastor the Kinder location, Church of the King Kinder. I want to take a quick minute before we dive into this thing, and I want to say how wonderful it is to be partnered with Lake Charles Campus. I want to say how wonderful it is to have your prayers and support. Knowing that you guys are backing us is just so wonderful. There are great things going on in Kinder, and we just love being a part of what's going on here. Now, we're going to dive into week two, and this message, I've titled it Travel Light. Now, have you ever taken a trip, like when me and my wife first started uh, taking trips when we got married, it was like we would back a U-Haul van up to our house, load almost the entire house, and we would people would be like, are y'all moving? People would be like, no, we're not moving. We're going on vacation for the weekend. Why? And they're like, does it take all of this? And it was like we would pack for a week, come back from the trip, and we had a month's worth of unpacking to do. You know, look, I'm going to be honest with you. I started looking at my life, and it was the same way. Like, I had so much baggage that I was carrying around with me that it was like life wasn't even fun anymore. And so God brought me to this one day, and it, it worked on me, and it, it challenged me. It was like, you're traveling life too heavy. And so many people nowadays, we do that. We travel like too heavy. We have so much baggage that we need to get rid of. Look, our vacations are so much funner when we just have a change of clothes and we go and enjoy the trip. And whatever we need on the trip, there's going to be a store around there that we can get it from. And it's the same thing with God. If we will learn to travel light, whatever we need in the future, God has for us. And so I tell people, I'm like, look, me and my wife, we've been happily married now for five years. And to be honest with you, out of 15 years, that's not too bad. But we've learned so much in those years that it's like we don't have to have all of everything that's in our house to take a road trip. So this week's two message is called Travel Light. Now, how many of you showing my age has ever seen the movie Groundhog Day. Like, it was such a great movie back in the day. And I know, yeah, like the millennials are probably like, Groundhog Day, what is that? Look, it's a good movie. Go ask your grandma, she'll be able to tell you about it. But Groundhog Day was such a great movie in the fact that the guy got stuck in a cycle of life. And he relived that cycle every day, every day, until his heart changed about life. As soon as his heart changed, it broke the cycle. And though it's, it's not a very biblical story, 
except in the fact that I believe there's so many of us that nowadays we have Groundhog Day marriages. Like, it's just the same thing every day, the same conversation. You pick the kids up here. You bring them here. You make sure this is done. Did we do the dishes? What time are we going to eat supper? Where are we going to be at? And we get stuck in this routine and a cycle of every day is the same thing. And to be honest with you, our marriages feel more like a partnership than they do a marriage. And I believe we have that. We get stuck in Groundhog Day marriages. I believe we get stuck in Groundhog Day finances. Like, you know the same person, and maybe you're one of them, is no matter how much money you make, no matter how many promotions you get, no matter how many jobs you go to, there's never enough money. And you get stuck in these cycles of we're always behind the eight ball. I believe we have Groundhog Day relationships to where our relationships never go past a certain point. And at the, when we get to that point, we either change relationships to get back in that place or we have the same people in our life. And to be honest with you, sometimes those people aren't even healthy for us. Sometimes we will entertain the toxic people because that's just the cycle that we're in and the life that we've become used to. Groundhog Day relationships. And so for me today, it is my challenge is going to be if you're stuck in something to where you feel like this is just a repeat over and over and over, maybe it's time that you learn that cycles can be broken. Things can be broken in our life, and we don't have to stay stuck in what we did in the past or what we are currently in. There is a life that God wants us to live that is so full of life and so so much more joy and passion and, and more than we can ever imagine. But sometimes it takes getting rid of things in our life, <laughs> unpacking the bags to be able to learn that we need to move forward in a different area of our life. And so I want to talk to you today. The passage that we're going to be looking at is in 2 Samuel. And to be honest with you, this is what, this is what happened. So backstory on it. King David is now king. Saul and Jonathan are both dead. And King David is like, I want to bless Saul's uh, people, man. Is there anybody left in the house of Saul? I want to show the kindness of God to, which in this day and age, I mean, uh, back then it was already odd, but in this day and age, nobody shows kindness to anybody. It is all about what I can get. We only are concerned about three people, me, myself, and I. And so for David to be wanting to show kindness to somebody else especially the old king's relatives because back in the day like when you would take over as being king you killed all of the other descendants that way you didn't have to worry about an uprising later on somebody trying to take you out of the the king the king role so david is looking for somebody from saul's descendant who he can bless and be kind to and this is where our story is and so it says in, in 2 Samuel chapter 9, verse 1, Now David said, Is there still anyone who is left from the house of Saul that I may show him the kindness for Jonathan's sake? Verse 2 says, And there was a servant of the house of Saul whose name was Ziba. So then they, they called him to David the king and said to him, Are you Ziba? He said, at your service. Then the king said, is there still someone of the house of Saul to whom I may show the kindness of God? And Ziba said to the king, there is still a son of Jonathan whom is lame in his feet. Now catch that part right there. The boy from Jonathan was lame in his feet. So king said to him, where is he? Ziba said to the king, indeed, he is in the house of Mashir, the son of Amiel in Lodabar. Now, okay, so Lodabar means in isolation. So what he was telling the king was, look, there is, a, there is somebody that is a descendant, but he's in Lodabar, he's in isolation, and nobody's had contact with him for years. Now, the boy has grown up, and he hasn't had contact with anybody. So then the king said in verse 5, he sent and brought him out of the house of Mashir and the son of Amiel from Lodabar. 
So verse 6 says, Now when Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, had came to David, he fell on his face and prostrated himself. Then David said, Mephibosheth? And he answered, Here is your servant. So David said to him, Don't fear, for I will surely show you the kindness for Jonathan, your father's sake, and will restore to you all the land of Saul, your grandfather, and you shall eat bread at my table continually. Then he bowed himself and said, What is your servant, that you should look upon me such a dead dog as I? Now, okay, what happened with this guy that he goes to the king's palace and the king is wanting to restore him to royalty. I mean, David's literally saying, look, don't worry about it. Don't sweat it. I am going to make you into something. I'm going to restore your grandfather's land. You're going to have bread. You're going to dine with me. You're going to have access to the palace. You're going to be like royalty in my eyes. What would make somebody look at him and say, are you kidding me? I'm just a dead dog. Look, you got to be messed up, hurt severely to view yourself as nothing more than a dead dog. And to be honest with you, this is, this is where Mephibosheth is. He's looking at himself saying, I'm nothing. And I believe there's a reason why he's doing that, why he's viewing himself like that. So, if we look in the Bible, the Bible talks about a thing called yokes. And here's what a yoke was. A yoke was, they would use it uh, to yoke the oxen. Now, here you got this big, powerful beast. And the oxen was actually was literally a beast of burden. Now, I know there's a song that's called Beast of Burden, but this was actually the literal beast of burden. They were used to pull the plows. And, you know, I was driving by a farm the other day, and there was this big eight-wheel tractor pulling this massive plow, and there was just black smoke pouring from this thing. Why? Because pulling that plow was a lot of work. And that's what the, the oxen would do is it would pull the plow. But the oxen was so strong that it couldn't, not just did it pull the plow, but it couldn't be controlled. A 200-pound man was not going to control this, this ox. So what they would do is they would take this yoke, and they would put it around this ox when the ox was young. Because they knew they couldn't control him in maturity, they would yoke him in its youth. Now the ox grows up, and all it knows is the yoke. And so, in maturity, it knew, as long as this yoke is on me, if they pull right, I have to go right. And look, do you? the enemy is trying to do the same thing to us today. That's why there is such a, an attack on our youth in, this, in, in the world because the enemy knows it may not be able to control them in their maturity, but if it can yoke them in their youth, then it will have a better chance in maturity. So now you've got, you've got people who, who are addicted with stuff or exposed to stuff when they were 12. I sat with a guy who had been a, who had been an addict all his life. The guy was probably in his 30s now. And he told me this. He said, "Kevin, somebody introduced me to something when I was 12, and I never could get the taste out of my mouth." And so he grew up all of his life being addicted to something because he was exposed to it in his youth. That's where the enemy put the yoke on. Was in his youth. And for for many of us, I mean, what has, what has happened before to you years ago and you're still carrying the baggage around years later? Look, I know in my own life, like there was things that I was exposed to back when I was in school and grade school that now I still fight and struggle with because I know, one, that this is not who God says I am. And I know, too, that God can break things off of my life. So what I was yoked with in my youth is not going to, it doesn't have to follow me in my maturity, but doesn't mean that I don't recall and remember what was yoked in my youth. 
It just means that I've been set free from things. And that's part of traveling light. That's part of unpacking our baggage. Is sometimes we have to realize that things that took place then doesn't have to affect us now. Look, I'm going to tell my church all the time in kinder, what you were labeled with before is not who God says you are now. And so you may have, in your life, it may be something that you were exposed to when you were young. And I often look at it, I'm like, okay, so this is why we have somebody who was molested when they were 15, or maybe there was a girl that was raped when she was young. And now every time her husband goes to touch her, she cringes because of what was yoked in her youth. Look, I want you to know you do not have to live that way. That God has a life for you. God says you are more than a conqueror. God says that there are better things for you. He considers you like David, a son and a daughter of the true, true most high God. And that kind of stuff, you don't have to carry with you the rest of your life. You can unpack that baggage. And that's what my hope for you and my prayer for you today is that through this series, you will begin to unpack stuff in your life and take this road trip. And your destination is not your starting place. So the yoke was something that they would put around the oxen when it was young to control it in its maturity. Now, if you read the passage about the yokes, there's also something else with it, and it's called the burden. And look, I'm going to tell you right now, every yoke comes with a burden. I had a guy one time that I was uh, counseling with, and him and his wife were there. He was an alcoholic, and he was like, I just don't understand why my wife is so upset about my drinking. And I was like, well, I mean, can you not see what you're doing to your family? And so I went and I got one of those baby carriage uh, carousels. Remember, they used to hold them over the baby carriage and they would lay and it would turtle. I mean, I've been out of the baby business a while. They might be using an iPad on the side of the crib now for all I know. But if you remember those, or you can go Google it and look it up. But I went and got one and I held it up and I grabbed one of the animals on it and I pulled it. And when I let it go, all the other animals, they shifted around. And I told him, I said, this is what's happening to your family and to the people around you. Every time that we give in to a yoke that the enemy has on us, every, the burden falls on everybody around us. They have to move. They have to, they have to do things. They have to make sure that, that you know, you're okay. And they have to make sure that this gets done and that gets done. And, and many of us are having to come up with a, a reason why they're not here or why this took place or something. It's everybody else's burden when you're older. The one thing about a yoke when you're young, it's just your burden. But when you get older, it's everybody that's connected to you. They have to suffer that burden also. That's why when we're at churches and stuff and, and the, the pastors give an altar call and we go up to the front and we get something off of our life, we unpack some baggage in our life, we turn around and we leave and we're like, oh my gosh, it was like such a weight lifted off of me. Yeah, because that burden is gone now. And, you know, grandma's in the corner over there. She's bawling her eyes. She got all that Mac and Mayor K makeup messed up because, you know, a movement of the Holy Spirits are normally, you know, man, there, there, it's messy. And she's like, oh, it's just such nice and wonderful that, that they went up to the front. They got this. The burden is lifted off of her, too. It's not just us. When yokes break in our life, when we unpack baggage in our life, the burden is lifted from us but it's also lifted from our loved ones. And I tell my congregation all the time, I'm like, man, we should be at the front on our knees at the altar every week if it's that good. You know, I mean, if getting those burdens and freeing us is so wonderful, why don't we do it more? I know in my own personal life, I had to look and I'm like, why am I not making sure all my yokes, all my baggage is undone so there's no more burdens on me? Because burdens weigh you down. They do. It's like, it's like trying to drive your vehicle on vacation while you're towing a tank. It's going to slow you down. So if that's the case, then we ought to be unpacking these burdens and stuff. And this is what this, I want to show you this verse right here in Isaiah, because this is, this is what it talks about right here. In Isaiah 10, 27, it says, 
it shall come to pass in that day that his burden will be taken away from your shoulder and his yoke from your neck and the yoke will be destroyed because of the anointing oil. You know, how do we get rid of yokes and how do we unpack stuff in our life? It's very simple. It's called the Holy Spirit. Like the Holy Spirit comes when we receive Christ and the Holy Spirit begins to work on us. And it begins to say, okay, this needs to go and this needs to go and this needs to go. And the more that we give that stuff up and the more that the Holy Spirit begins to convict us, it breaks the yoke and it lifts the burden. And the enemy has gotten to where he has convinced us that going to God and going and praying with people and, and confessing to things and stuff is, oh no, that's taboo. I don't want people to know what's going on in my life. I don't I want people to think that I'm perfect. Well, I will be honest with you. There's not but one perfect person ever walked this face of this earth and he died over 2,000 years ago. None of us are, including myself. And so the Bible says in James that we should confess to one another so that we may be healed. So look, Talking to people and, and getting people involved in your situation is what's going to bring the healing. The Holy Spirit's going to break the curse. He's going to break the yoke. He's going to help you unpack some baggage. He's going to lift the burden from you. You're going to feel great. And talking with people and getting people that hold you accountable is going to bring healing in your life. So, we talked about yokes. We talked about burdens. We just talked about what breaks those off of us. It's called the Holy Spirit. It's the anointing. When the anointing is in you, it breaks the yoke. Now, here's what I find that is so misconstrued. Everybody, they, you know, they call me and they're like, you know, well, Pastor, would you come pray for me? And hey, by all means, I will pray with anybody. But you don't need me to pray for you. You have the same power that rose Jesus from the grave living in you. The same anointing that is on me is on you. My anointing just looks different. But you can do that. You can, you can be with the Holy Spirit and break things off your life. You don't have to have the pastor there to do it. You can do that right where you're sitting at today. You can do it while you're drinking your cup of coffee or eating your bowl of cereal, watching this message today. And at the end of this sermon, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you a time that you can do that. So we talked about yokes. We talked about burdens. We talked about what breaks them. I want to show you just what happened in Mephibosheth's life that caused him to view himself as a dog. And it's found in 2 Samuel chapter 4, verse 4. Jonathan, the Saul's son, who had, who, uh, so it says it in 2 Samuel, verse, chapter 4, verse 4, Jonathan, Saul's son, had a son who was lame in his feet. He was five years old when the news about Saul and Jonathan came from Jezreel, and his nurse took him up and fled. And it happened that she made haste to flee, that he fell and became lame. And his name was Mephibosheth. So here's what took place. Saul and Jonathan were both killed. News came. And so the nurse feared for Mephibosheth's life. She grabbed him and in haste tried to get out of the palace and try to hide him and get him stored away so they wouldn't find out about him. And she dropped him. At age five, he's now lame. Grows up the rest of his life in this condition. Years later, brought back to the palace to be restored as royalty still views himself as a lame dog. That's why he says, I'm nothing more than a dead dog. He viewed himself according to his condition, something that happened when he was five. Be careful because it's oftentimes 
the people that are closest to us, the people that we trust, it's often them who drop us. Maybe today you're, you're the same way. The, the gentleman that I was telling you about earlier who had the addiction, he told me, he said, my brother exposed me to a drug when I was 12 years old and I never could get the taste out of my mouth. He was so upset and angry with his brother 30 years later because he trusted his brother and his brother dropped him. And maybe that's you. Maybe, maybe there was something done in your life earlier in life by, by maybe a family member or maybe somebody that you trusted or something. Maybe, maybe they exposed you to something. Maybe they did something to you, whatever it is. And now you've grown up understanding or thinking that this is who I am and this is what, it is, what my life is. I want you to know, Jesus is trying to restore you back to royalty. And oftentimes we're viewing ourselves as nothing. I know like for me, whenever I was putting this message together, like I had to do some thinking like you know, what took place in my life years ago that, that I've never gotten free from because it was somebody that I trusted that damaged me. And I was like, wow, there are so much stuff with people that I trusted that I would follow. And then all of a sudden I would have, I would have a smoking habit or I would have a, an alcohol habit or, or look, I'll be perfectly honest. I'll be transparent with you. When I was in high school, I had a drug problem. I mean, not, I wasn't like, you know, the worst, but I did drugs when I was in high school because of people that I trusted. Thank God that he delivered me from all of that. Because all I look back and see is that the enemy was trying to yoke me when I was young. Because he knew he couldn't control me when I was in maturity. And if it wouldn't be that, that Jesus broke those yokes in my life, that the, the anointing was there and that it lifted the burden and everything, Look, I may not be, I may not be pastoring today because of it. And there's people's lives today that have been affected because God has chosen to use me as a pastor that might have never been affected had I still viewed myself yoked by something in my past. Look, you may be delivered, but damaged. And if that's you today, like you got to know that you are so much more than your label. You are so much more than what happened to you years ago and what yoked you years ago. Like, be careful because oftentimes those yokes are at the place where you were dropped. And so if that's you today, I want to give you an opportunity to just, just go to Jesus and get some stuff broke off your life. Get some burdens lifted. And so I just, I want to lead you in a prayer. I want to pray for you. I want to pray over you. And I want to lead you in a prayer that, that today something may break in your life and something may change and some baggage in your life may get off of your life. So you can take this road trip with us and end in a destination that you never dreamed was possible. So if that's you, just, I just want to pray for you right now. Father, I come to you today for, for the ones that are watching this. Father, I pray over their life. I pray that you, that you come upon them right now, Father. Any yokes that's, that's been put by the enemy, Father, I pray that you break those right now, Father, in the name of Jesus. I pray that you lift the burden, Lord, that, that they will just, that they will draw close to you and that they will begin to, to just be filled with your spirit, Father, and that all that garbage from the past, Father, will leave their life today. 
maybe for you, maybe this is the first time that, that you've viewed uh, God or anything else. And I want to give you an opportunity. Maybe you say, I don't even know what, what this spirit is you're talking about. I want to give you that opportunity because the Bible says that if we confess with our mouth that he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins. And so if that's you today and you just want to call on Jesus and you just want salvation, I want to give you that opportunity. Because the Bible says that if we believe the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus our Lord, and we call on him that we're saved, that we're going to be saved. And so I want to give you that opportunity. Father, maybe today there's somebody, Lord, that you're drawing to yourself, that you're you're drawing to you, Father. I pray that you will you will allow them to call on your name, Father, to, to believe what you did, believe in your son, Jesus, Father, that he paid the price that none of us could pay, that he lived the life that none of us could live, Father, so that we could be in heaven with you one day when we die. Father, I thank you for all of what you've done today in the lives of the people. We love you. We ask this word go out and be blessed. In your name, amen. Hey guys, I love you guys. I'm new to the family. They call me the redneck of the bunch. Can't wait to be with you next time.